In this video, I'll show you my favorite 3D printed mechanical keyboard. This video will explain all of my changes to the original model and provide an assembly and programming guide if you would like to build one for yourself. Stay tuned. Mad Mod. Hello 3D printing fans and mechanical keyboard enjoyers. I'm very excited because today I finally get to talk about my favorite mechanical keyboard design. If you've been following me anywhere else, you might already know that I've been making some keyboards. I have tried several 3D printable models from other creators. I tried some that were super simple and some that had very unique designs. And then I found this one. This 3D printed beauty was created by Thingiverse user Fumbucker and posted to the site in 2018. This keyboard features a layout that's based on the Clueboard 66% and the Leopold FC660M. After printing one out, I was immediately impressed with how easy everything went together. All the parts are small enough to easily fit within the print volume of most 3D printers. The case is mechanically held together with bolts, so you don't need to mess around with gluing or plastic welding. And once assembled, it feels surprisingly sturdy and rigid. Naturally, there's some aspects of this design that I wanted to modify. Here is my first revision. I've modded the plate and the top bezel to add two more keys. After assembling this one, I realized how unusual it is to find keycap sets with two 2.25 unit shift keys. I also wanted to remove this blank area and use a different set of tactile switches. In the second revision, I designed a completely new plate with a five millimeter thickness and a condensed layout. This made it much easier to find good looking keycap sets. In this model, I used a set of YOK Trash Panda switches and some GMK Black Lotus keycaps. I still use this keyboard every day because I like the layout. It has everything I need and nothing I don't. This brings me to the most recent revision. This keyboard is exactly the same as the previous one, but I've modified the USB breakout mount to fit a readily available USB Type-C breakout board. This particular keyboard has Holy Panda switches. I have posted this revised model on my Colts 3D page. Feel free to download it and build one for yourself. There's a link in the description below. Let's take a look at what you would need to build one of these keyboards. You will need one Teensy 2.0 microcontroller, one USB-C breakout board, 68 one in 4148 diodes, 68 of your favorite mechanical keyboard switches, a compatible set of keycaps, three two-unit plate mount stabilizers, and one 6.25-unit plate mount stabilizer for the spacebar. You will also need eight 12-millimeter M3 bolts, eight 20-millimeter M3 bolts, and 16 M3 nuts. Of course, you will also need some wire and maybe a set of adhesive rubber feet for the bottom. All tools and supplies used in this assembly will be linked in the description below. The keyboard featured in this video was printed in silk PLA with a layer height of 0.2 millimeters. The back side of the keyboard prints out in three separate pieces. The plate prints out in two pieces that lock together. This top bezel prints out in two separate pieces that are offset from the rest, so they lock the keyboard together. All of these 3D models can be printed easily without supports. I will begin the assembly process by installing the switches in the keyboard plate. Halfway there. Next, I'll need to install those stabilizers. I got a little bit ahead of myself, snapping all those switches into place, so I'm going to remove the switches for the keys that require a stabilizer. These are your typical Cherry compatible plate mount stabilizers. Install them by feeding the hooked side in first and then pressing them into place. The stabilizer bar rests in this cutout area on the back side of the plate. Stabilizers must also be installed for the backspace, enter, and left shift keys. With all that out of the way, it's time to start wiring the switch matrix. I will be bending the diode lead into a little loop so that it stays in place while I'm soldering. In this configuration, the striped side of the diode should always be facing away from the switches. 
The wiring process is easily the most time consuming part of this project. I like to tackle this one row at a time. In this example, I will be connecting a diode to each switch in the first row. Then I'll give you a close up of how I create the rows for this matrix. After zooming in, you can get a good look at how each diode is attached. I am going to connect these together by bending the bottom lead to a right angle and soldering to the next diode in the row. This process is then repeated for every diode in the row. This is what the first row looks like once it is completed. Since this is one of the more time-consuming portions of this project, I will not be showing the creation of every row in this video. The wiring of this matrix was completed live on stream. If you are interested in seeing the entire process, go check out my Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash m0dulus. That's twitch.tv slash modulus. Building a hand-wired keyboard requires a lot of soldering. If you are looking for a project to practice your soldering skills, I would definitely recommend giving this a try. If you are already experienced with a soldering iron, you may want to put on some music to pass the time. Here is a completed look at one side of the keyboard. So far, I think this has taken me about 45 minutes to complete. Of course, this still has to be connected to the other side. If you like videos about electronics, 3D printing, or retro gaming, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. I have a long list of ideas for new videos like this one. Don't forget to leave a like on the video if you like it. Thank you so much for watching. After the rows on both sides of the keyboard have been wired up, I will connect them together. Some of the switches that are very far apart, like the space bar here, will require a jumper wire to complete the row. Here is a completed look at all five keyboard rows. To finish building the matrix, the second pin on each switch must now be connected in a column. Wiring the columns is a little bit less straightforward than the rows. No more diodes are required, but you do have a choice at how you connect each switch. I'm going to start off by giving you a basic explanation of how I go about wiring these columns. Starting off with a piece of 24 gauge wire, I will connect it to the unused pin on the first switch. Then moving on to the next switch in the column, I will use my soldering iron to melt off a piece of the wire's insulation. The exposed portion of the wire can then be soldered on to the second switch. This process gets repeated for every switch in the column. Here is the wiring diagram that shows how I have every switch arranged in columns and rows. If you would like to flash the firmware that I have included with the project files, you must follow this wiring diagram exactly. I will be including a brief explanation on how you can go about creating a very basic keyboard firmware. Here is a close-up look at the creation of the second column. I will continue to use different colored wires on each column. This makes for a much easier time when it's time to install and program the microcontroller. Wiring all 15 columns takes about as long as it took to assemble all 5 rows. I will be showing a time lapse of this process to keep the video at a watchable length. If you would like to see the columns wired at a normal pace, that video is also available on my Twitch channel. Here is a look at the completed switch matrix. Now that all of the switches are connected, I can create the firmware and install the microcontroller. With most keyboard projects, I like to start out by creating my keyboard inside Keyboard Layout Editor. This website is an extremely valuable tool for designing keyboard layouts and I will have a link in the description below this video. An easy way to create QMK firmware without knowing all the ins and outs of QMK is to copy your keyboard layout from the raw data section on KeyboardLayoutEditor.com. This data can be pasted into a keyboard firmware generator like the one available at kbfirmware.com. Just a little disclaimer, this solution is technically outdated and not really supported anymore, but it is a very easy way you can get started making custom keyboard firmware. After importing the keyboard layout data, you can use the wiring page on Keyboard Firmware Builder to define the row and column for each key. If you are designing a new layout, be sure to make use of the flip option since you would normally be looking at your keyboard wiring job from the backside. Here is another look at the completed wiring for the firmware that's included with this project. Here it is flipped so you 
can see how it matches the keyboard wiring. After the wiring page is configured to match your keyboard layout, on the pins page you will be able to define a pin on the microcontroller for each row and column. Here are the pins I will be using for each row and column of the matrix. Be sure to reference this image if you are following along with my design at home. Let's go ahead and connect the Teensy while this page is still pulled up. Here I will be connecting the wire coming from each row and then each column to its pin on the microcontroller as defined on the keyboard firmware generator. I will be holding the Teensy in place with a piece of double-sided tape. Up next is the key map page. On the key map page, you can define the function of each key on your keyboard. This includes adding media keys and function keys that allow you to shift onto different keyboard layers. Here's an image of the default layer key map that I have created for this project. Pressing the function key will allow you to shift onto layer one. Layer one contains the function row keys, as well as some basic media keys and a set of keys that emulate mouse input. For this basic layout, I will not be recording any macros or using any quantum functions. If you are creating your own firmware, in the settings page, be sure to give it a unique name and select the correct bootloader size for your microcontroller. Next, we can move on over to the compile tab and select download.hex. After downloading, it's time to plug in the Teensy and flash the new firmware. To flash this microcontroller, you must have the Arduino IDE installed and the Teensy Duino software add-on. I will have a link to this in the description of this video. With the Teensy plugged in, open up the Arduino IDE and make sure you have the correct board and port selected. These options are found in the Tools menu. Next, open up an example project by navigating to File, Examples, Basics, Blink. Click the Upload button to begin programming the Teensy. The Teensy programming software will open automatically. From this interface, click the Open Hex File button and navigate to the file that was downloaded from the keyboard firmware generator. After selecting your firmware.hex file, press the Program button on the Teensy microcontroller. This will reboot the Teensy into program mode and automatically flash the firmware file. Once flashing has completed, your keyboard should now be functional. I recommend heading over to KeyboardTester.com here, you can set your monophonic sound experience to Josh and make sure that every key is functioning as expected. The last piece that requires soldering is the USB Type-C breakout board. Since the Teensy 2.0 has mini USB, we will need to adapt this by cutting the end off of a mini USB cable. The black wire must be soldered to the ground pin. The red wire must be soldered to the VCC pin. The green wire must be soldered to the Data Plus pin. And the white wire must be soldered to the Data Minus pin. I'm going to use a drop of super glue to hold the USB breakout board in place. Now it's time to perform the final assembly. Thankfully, this is probably the easiest part of the entire project. To assemble this keyboard, just sandwich the plate between the top bezel and the back part of the case. Insert a bolt through the top side of the case and feed a nut into the hexagonal hole on the bottom side of the case. Up next is the side with the USB port. Don't forget to plug this one in. Installing the middle piece will hold both sides of the keyboard together. The only thing left to do is install some keycaps. Keycap sets that fit this layout are available in a variety of profiles. I chose to go with a set of GMK Faro clones because I like the cherry profile and the color of the legends match the color of this keyboard pretty closely.
Here is a look at the finished product. So far, every 3D printed keyboard I have made has a unique sound profile and typing experience. With 3D printing, customization options extend far beyond swapping switches and keycaps. What are some of your thoughts on 3D printed keyboards? Have you ever built a handwired keyboard? What unusual layout would be easier to 3D print than order a PCB? This will not be my last custom keyboard, so if you have any ideas, be sure to leave a comment below this video. While you're at it, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel and go follow me on Twitch. Thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you in the next one.